Hello and welcome. We're coming to you live from University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinic located in Madison, Wisconsin. My name is Dr. James Maloney. I'm going to be your host for today's program. And joining me is my colleague, Dr. Tracy Weigel, who is the chief of uh, the section of thoracic surgery at our institution. Dr. Weigel and I are thoracic surgeons with UW Health's Heart, Vascular, and Thoracic Care Program. Welcome, Dr. Weigel. Also joining us is the Chief of Thoracic Anesthesia, Dr. Sergei Lepukin. Uh, My pleasure. Welcome to you also. And later in the program, you're going to meet our clinical nurse specialist, Kyla Schoenwetter, who will be talking to us about what patients can expect after surgery and some of the uh, immediate uh, post-operative care. <clears throat> um, the topic for today's webcast is VATS lobectomy. And VAT stands for Video Assisted Thoracoscopic Surgery. And what it is is a minimally invasive approach um, that can be used to treat many diseases within the chest, but has been extremely uh, beneficial in the treatment of lung cancer. So before we get started, I want to mention that over the next hour, we will be answering <clears throat> your email questions about VATS and lung cancer, and also some of the things that happen in the uh, immediate time after surgery for patients. To send us questions now or at any time during the broadcast, just click the Ask a Question button on your webcast screen, and we'll welcome your questions and we'll answer as many of them as we can over the next hour. Also, this webcast will be available on demand later this evening if you would like to share this program with a friend or family member, and they can access this program through the website later this evening they will also be able to access this program in the future uh, on the UW Health website. And now let's get started. <clears throat> so thoracoscopic surgery or VAT surgery is a, is a helpful technique in, in treat, treating all sorts of ailments of the, of the chest, including lung cancer. Um, by using small incisions and port sites, we're able to access the inside of the chest and the structures that we uh, need to manipulate without spreading the chest. Uh, Dr. Weigel, maybe you can tell us some of the benefits of, of minimally invasive surgery for lung cancer. Well, the primary um, benefit is less invasion to the patient, which means less pain, a quicker postoperative recovery, uh, fewer complications in uh, skilled hands, and the patient is then able to progress to additional therapies that may be needed. If things like chemotherapy are needed postoperatively, patients can get to the chemotherapy quicker, do their faster recovery, and get through it easier. And this has been shown in several studies now. Thoracoscopic surgery has been uh, done at the university here since the early 90s. and, and Currently, it's one of the only institutions that are uh, local institutions around the Wisconsin area offering this minimally invasive treatment for lung cancer. About what percentage of patients are, are we now treating for uh, uh, treating with vatslobectomy for lung cancer? Um, I would say somewhere between 75 and 85 percent of patients who have lung cancer are having their surgeries done thoracoscopically. Um, historically, a more advanced tumor was a contraindication to doing the surgery because people thought that you couldn't do as good a dissection or get all the nodes, but that has been shown not to be the case, and I would say we, we virtually approach every patient thoracoscopically or minimally invasively, and approximately 10 to 15 percent of the time we would have to convert to a more invasive or what we would call an open procedure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We also have Dr. Uh, Sergei Lepukin with us um, here, and I know that many of my patients in clinic ask questions about the anesthetic and specifically about, um, about how we deflate that lung and, and, more importantly, how we reinflate it at the end of the operation. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, how the anesthesia members of the sure. team uh, assist in this, in this sure. uh, operation. It's a very good question because um, <clears throat> an aesthetic goal uh, for this procedure is um, to protect the patient from the surgical invasion and make sure that the patient does well throughout the procedure. And on, this, on the other hand, uh, we need to help surgeons to make it happen because you cannot operate on the lung that keeps breathing. 
So here comes the um, isolation, what we call, of, the, of one lung that's being operated on. We achieve that by using double lumen tubes, which means it's like a double barrel gun thing that uh, we can separately ventilate both lungs. And most people, probably more than 95% of patients tolerate one lung ventilation very well. In order to figure out who's going to be difficult, we um, do a very thorough preoperative evaluation of those patients to make sure that they, we can get them safely through this procedure. So here we use the help of uh, local health providers, primary care physicians, who give us information about the cardiac status, about uh, comorbidities or other diseases that those patients have so that we can take it into account and make a plan that is perfectly safe for every patient. Um, so that's basically what our goals are and uh, that's how we do things. And uh, we, hit, we have sort of a follow-up question from our audience uh, uh, that says, uh, if you are operating on a patient's lung, how does the patient breathe during surgery? And I think we answered that question to some degree, but... Um, yes, indeed. Uh, well, when we place the double lumen tube, we can clamp one, one of the lumens and deflate the lung that needs to be operated on. And the patients are doing pretty well breathing just with one lung. Because normally we don't use all our vital capacity of our lungs to breathe when we're not doing any sternous activity. Uh, so uh, most patients tolerate one lung ventilation pretty well. At the end of the procedure, we reinflate the operative, operative lung, and, and uh, the surgeons control that reinflation by looking through those little telescopes that they insert into the chest to make sure that the lung is all spread it out. There's no leaks, um, no accidental injuries to the lung that needs repair. And um, then the patient resume, resume re all the patients resume breathing spontaneously eventually and uh, we pull the breathing tube at the end of the procedure and uh, everybody's doing well. I think it's important to emphasize, Sergey, that the when we say deflate, it's a passive process and we simply literally open the system up to air and let the lung passively collapse. We don't pop the lung or do anything injurious right. to the lung to make it deflate. Right, right. It happens pretty naturally. If you, if you let the air come into the chest, then uh, and if the airway is open, the lung passively collapses, exhaling passively all the air out of it, and uh, uh, reduces its size dramatically. Uh, so it creates the space in the chest for good visualization of the operative field and, and the tumor if there is. Um, uh, so, yeah. And we're going to be getting ready to uh, uh, play a, a video of a, of a surgery that has been uh, done recently. And, and uh, again, I think one of the important uh, aspects of, of our approach here is, is that approach of, of a team. You'll see in this video some of, um, some of our team members, of course, um, not just surgeons like Dr. Weigel and myself, but uh, our anesthesia colleagues, our dedicated thoracic surgery uh, anesthesia, and also um, our uh, scrub tech, circulating nurse, um, and all the other providers who are integral to making this process work. I think it's very important to stress that before we even started doing the VATS lobes, we trained our team because the procedure, though less invasive for the patient, is really in some ways a higher, a more risky patient in that the chest isn't wide open and it's actually a more difficult procedure for surgeons than doing it with a big open incision. So one of the most important things we did was to set up a team and, and do a lot of drills before we even started getting everybody up to speed as to how we dealt with different situations. And we have a very dedicated team that scrubs the majority of these cases, which is a, both a, a tech and a thoracic nurse as well as thoracic anesthesia. Here we're seeing the uh, beginning of the surgical portion uh, where we already have a, a port uh, with a camera inside the chest space. Uh, Dr. Weigel and our fellow, uh, uh, Dr. Nam, are, are making an incision. You see our, our uh, scrub tech, Tara, uh, who's there uh, with them. Um, as we're uh, entering into the chest space, they're using electrocautery to um, to uh, make sure that there are no small bleeding vessels uh, from this area. Um, through these incisions, we'll be inserting uh, long, thin tools, as you see there. 
Um, many of the tools are very similar to the, to the instruments we use in open surgery. However, because of the uh, minimally invasive approach, they have to be somewhat longer and somewhat, somewhat thinner. Um, you can see up in the uh, upper corner of the uh, screen the uh, small retraction uh, device, something called a wheat lantern, that's actually just spreading some of the soft tissue um, up at the uh, top of the, uh, of the screen, as I mentioned. And, um, and though that retractor is in place, we don't use retractors that uh, spread the ribs. And um, that's, again, the important part of thoracoscopic surgery. And the importance of that is simply that it's the rib spreading that actually causes the pain, not the skin incision or a separation of the fat. Mm -hmm. um, and the tools that Jim's alluding to there are two very large, almost look like Q-tips that are very soft dissecting instruments that are used to spread the t tissue. But they're approximately five millimeters in size, just to give you a frame of reference, which is about a fifth of an inch. Mm -hmm. um, you may add something. Sure. Looking at those small incisions, what comes to mind is that uh, the amount of pain that patients experience after surgery is uh, very small, uh, much less than with a large thoraco thoracotomy that uh, we used to do for, for uh, lung cancer operations. Okay. And it's much easier for us to manage post-operative pain in those patients. It's easy to infiltrate small incisions with long-acting long, uh, local anesthetic. Uh, do intercostal nerve blocks, and the patients uh, wake up much more comfortable than uh, and, and after may, a large thoracotomy. And maybe we'll pause the uh, the uh, clip, the video clip, for a second because we have another uh, question from our audience. And, and the question was, um, and and this feeds into what you were talking about, Dr. Uh, Lapukin. What are the possible complications of this procedure? And and one of them, of course, is is pain. Um, pain that we all agree is less than with an open procedure. Um, but maybe you can uh, just briefly tell us what, what we uh, uh, do to help control pain afterwards and uh, then well, talk that, about that, some of the other complications. That might actually be easier for me to answer because historically we used to use a lot of epidurals which involved uh, Sergey and his department. But with these incisions, they're so small that we don't really feel like we need that. And I believe, and I'll let Sergey comment, but I believe our anesthesia <coughs> colleagues also feel that we don't need an epidural for this particular position. Mm -hmm. So we instead use preemptive anesthesia prior to the surgery. The patient is giving a long-acting uh, narcotic with a little sip of water that lasts for about 12 hours. And then we instill uh, local anesthesia to the what's called the intercostal nerves and the nerves around the ribs. And then post-operatively, we often supplement their anesthesia with a balance between opioids and non-steroidals um, almost all the time by mouth, not by IV. And frequently we are able to get the tube out so quickly post-op, usually that night or the next day, that their pain really is minimal. And many patients go home just on the, non the what we call non-steroidals, like a Motrin or an Advil, and or Tylenol and, and not opioids. So we've actually anesthesia's um, input or, or or need to assist us with the post-operative anesthesia has been diminished, but they do have assisted us with the creating this preemptive, preoperative anesthesia. Yeah, good pain control prior to the procedure and during the procedure kind of sets the stage for a uh, much easier pain-wise uh, post-operative period in those patients. Um, so everything goes pretty well. And and. What other complications uh, do, do people worry about with this procedure? Um, I think the, procedure, the complication that people worry the most about is bleeding. Historically, surgeons are used to big incisions where they can put their hands in and deal with anything. But what we found is that with very precise surgery and good anesthesia that keeps the lung from moving, and basically following the exact same principles that we do with open surgery, often using the identical instruments, that bleeding really is is just no different or no worse or and than when we do open surgery and we we don't um, transfuse any additional blood. In fact, the vast majority, probably ninety nine percent of patients, don't require any blood transfusions for this procedure. Um, another risk of any lung surgery is the lung leaking air, but the vatslobectomy technique has actually diminished the chance that the patient will leak air postoperatively because we've changed how we do this operation in the sense that 
a lot of what we call the fissure work or the separating one lobe from the other is done with stapling devices now and with less actual what we call sharp dissection. So the incidence of patients leaking air postoperatively is dramatically <coughs> reduced, which is what enables us to get the tubes out quicker and enables us to deal with their pain better and gets them out of the hospital quicker. And maybe we'll roll, uh, roll our video uh, again. We'll continue through some of this because I think we're going to see some of that dissection and some of the, um, the instruments that, that we use, like the staplers, that help diminish air leak. Um, so um, here we're, again, looking at the inside of the uh, chest cavity. We're looking at the fissure, the division between the lobes of the lung. How, how important is that division between the lobes during this kind of surgery? Well, it's, it's not critical, but in this particular case, the lobes are very nicely divided, and it makes the procedure a little bit easier. Um, but it's, it's absolutely not essential. I think you could see a little bit there. Um, when the two lobes are separated with the upper lobe being on the top left of your screen and the lower lobe being on the bottom right of the screen. Um, in between those lobes, right, as you can see there, are some lymph nodes and those are dissected with the specimen as well. And underneath that, or between those two lobes, is the, is the artery that feeds the lower lobe and the branches that go to the upper lobe. And that's part of where our dissection will begin. Um, here we jumped a little bit back to the front of the heart, and the heart is on the left of your screen. The vein draining the upper lobe is right there next to that little metal grasper, and that's the left upper lobe in the top right part of the screen. And what we're doing here is simply starting the dissection. It's done identical, open versus, when, i.e. with a big incision, versus when we do it with the scopes. We're going to isolate the artery and the vein and the airway or the bronchus that go to the upper lobe to enable us to take it out in one piece um, to do the same lobectomy that we would do as if we did it with uh, a big open incision. And now as we, look at, as we look at these structures and some of these instruments, the instruments seem so big. I these think that's these instruments are five millimeters in size, which is about a fifth of an inch. So. They're actually very long, but they're not very big. That's the beauty of this procedure is that the camera gives you a nice magnification and you can manipulate that magnification. You can zoom in and zoom out and see the larger picture and, and you can see finer structures. And I think that would allow surgeons to be so precise in, in dissections. And In fact, what you're seeing there, although it, to the non-surgeon may seem like a, a significant amount of blood, that's about a teaspoon of blood. And so it's not a significant amount. It's just so better um, visualized with the scope and the light. When I started doing these, some of the surgeons said, how can you work to such a small hole you can't see? And the, it's absolutely not true. In fact, you see much, much better with the scope than when you did with open surgery. And one of the benefits of that is everybody in the, in the operating room, from anesthesia Including to your tech anesthesia. to your nurse, all yeah. see what's going on, and they know where we are with the case, and, they, and they, it helps them follow and assist better in the procedure as well. I'm fostering that team approach. Um, here we're going around a, a blood vessel again in, in the fissure. Um, we see again the uh, extended fancy Q-tip that we're using for that soft, blunt dissection. Um. This is just an artery to the upper lobe, and this is an instrument that I'm using now. It's an instrument that I've been using for 25 years open. It's the identical <clears throat> instrument. We put it through that slightly larger incision that's about an inch and a half, two inches at the top of the uh, screen earlier in the, uh, in the mm -hmm. broadcast. And what we're doing here is just isolating the artery, getting ready to divide it with a stapler, the same way we did it open for years before we converted to the thoracoscopic technique. So really, the operation at the end of the day or even during the procedure, if, if one didn't know they were looking in the chest, if one didn't realize they were looking at a screen, would be identical. And I think that's the main goal in doing this operation is to do the identical cancer operation because the first priority is doing the right cancer operation for the patient. And the, the benefit is, one, the better visibility and the less pain, but the importance of doing the right cancer operation and a thorough cancer operation is, is, not, um, um, is definitely the priority in the, any operation. 
And now one thing I think it, that it would be uh, good to discuss is w the structure that we're dealing with uh, there um, and the importance of, of that structure in this operation. So the, the, the darker area below the vein, um, maybe you'd like to talk about that lymph node and, and lymph nodes generally and how important they are in this operation. Well, what we're doing here is gradually <coughs> developing and dividing the pulmonary arteries to the upper lobe. The left upper lobe has a variable num uh, blood supply and it can have as few as two or even three pulmonary arteries. This patient had, I believe, five uh, small branches to her upper lobe. And what we're doing is carefully preserving the blood supply to the lower lobe as we individually divide the upper lobe branches and we're reflecting the lymph nodes um, you can see one on the upper lobe specimen right there. The, mm -hmm. That grabber is actually holding the upper lobe, and there's lymph nodes on the lung tissue there that are going to be take, or taken or given to the pathologist with the specimen to ensure that we adequately and, and accurately stage the patient appropriately. And um, what we're doing here is continuing to take additional branches of the pulmonary artery to the left upper lobe to, we're isolating them first and then dividing them in the exact same way we've done them open for many, many years. And maybe we can pause our video there for just a moment while uh, we take the model that we have available to us and Dr. Weigel can show uh, in a more schematic way what, what the, the goal is for the operation so for this patient. The, the left lung has two big, two lobes. This is a, a mock of a tumor here, and the left upper lobe has four segment, sub-segments. There's a division, which this model doesn't have, though, between the upper lobe and the lower lobe, and that was that fissure that we were talking about earlier. If you flip the lung, oh, the lung sits in the chest like this and, and abuts the heart right um, on its medial aspect, and the blood supply to the lung come off of the heart and go into the lung. And so what we're doing um, is to individually divide the blood supply, we start with the blood supply leaving the lung um, to prevent manipulation of the tumor and whatnot to potentially, although not necessarily proven, shed tumor cells that would go back systemically. So we divide the vein first, which is the, the blood leaving the lung to the upper lobe, and then we individually divide all of the arteries to the upper lobe, and then finally, near the end of the procedure, we divide the bronchus or the windpipe to the upper lobe, and then the upper lobe would be completely detached from the um, heart, and we will then put it in a, a sterile collecting bag and we move it from the chest. Uh, attendant with that operation is taking out the lymph nodes. Uh, there are certain stations or areas that we take that are typical drainage of tumors that ensure us to, that we have staged the patient appropriately and taken any local or regional disease along with the primary tumor, um, and that also assists in what we call local control, preventing the tumor from coming back. And, of course, assist us in deciding whether uh, additional therapies Correct. are going to be needed for the patient. And why don't we continue rolling, um, uh, rolling the video for a little bit. I think we have another uh, question from our uh, audience, and, and that is, is that the normal color of the lung? And maybe either Dr. Lapukin or, um, or Dr. Weigel can, can answer that because we, we all have a, a role sure. in how that lung looks. Sure. Yeah, when we saw in the mock-up is the inflated sort of a large uh, upper lobe. And here on the screen, we see that this upper lobe is completely collapsed. And when the lung is, uh, the, the air exits the lung, uh, the alveoli, those little bubbles that the lung tissue consists of, um, they kind of uh, stick together and form this kind of a uh, more solid appearing uh, structure in the chest, and it's usually more bluish because, uh, for one thing, we're ligating the vein, and it causes a little bit of congestion there. But when the surgery is done, and the rest of the lung that uh, stayed in uh, in the chest is being re-expanded, it, it acquires again normal appearance. It's pinky, frothy, healthy-looking tissue. Uh, the, sometimes those black markings um, uh, in 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 the parenchyma of the lung or in the tissue of the lung is the traces of carbon or uh, particles of soot or coal that we inhale. Uh, especially smokers have a lot of them and the lung looks not as pretty as it is here. 
So that's a normal, normal situation. There's nothing wrong with this. It's just a collapsed lung. And another question from our, uh, uh, from our viewers. How long does the procedure take? Um, it depends on the lobe and the patient and the tumor. Um, it's base, the lower lobes tend to be a little bit quicker than the upper lobes because they have less blood vessels going to them. Um, a bad slobectomy can take as short as 45 minutes to an hour or it can take as long as three hours. Um, we don't really worry about how long it takes because as long as it's done safely and if we can avoid the spreading of the ribs, we have decreased the pain significantly. So I think the main um, point that I learned initially when we're doing these was that the time is spent at the appropriate area of the operation, i.e. doing the dissection, not opening the chest and closing the chest, which we, where it's spent quite a bit of time when you're doing a conventional thoracotomy. But here, the, you're the, getting in the chest, making the appropriate port sites and all, takes about 10 minutes. And then the rest of the operation is actually spent operating, dissecting out the, the various structures. So um, the shorter answer is, is, to me, it doesn't matter how long it takes as long as the patient, it's done safely with good anesthesia and no bleeding. The, the other thing that I, that I would point out to our audience, and, and I always like to point out to, a, to the family members of, of, our, of my patients, is that there is, of course, the operative time, but there is also the time we get ready for the operation that exactly. Dr. Lapukin and, and his crew help with, and then reversing all of those things afterwards. And so for, for the family members, it, it, it's always a longer period of time waiting uh, than the actual surgical and You're operative right. time. You're right. I always, I always, when I talk to the patients and <clears throat> patient's family, I tell them that the actual operation is going to start probably within after 35 or 40 minutes after, after we bring the patient to the operating room because um, Dr. Weigel needs to do a bronchoscopy first and pretty, do a pretty thorough evaluation of the, what's going on inside the, the airway, inside the bronch or the trachea or the windpipe. So. Um, so it takes time. Then we change the single lumen tube for this double lumen tube that uh, allows us to ventilate the lungs separately. Um, and then we need to turn the patient on the side and prepare the operative field sterilely and drape the patient. And uh, it takes a little bit of time. So the procedure itself, the operation itself, takes much shorter time than the whole time spent in the operating room. We frequently also um, trying to expedite the workup of the patient. Um, if the patient has been evaluated with conventional non-invasive technologies such as CAT scan and PET scan, then we will do the bronchoscopic exam and also what the EBUS or the endobronchial ultrasound, which is used to better stage the lymph nodes. It's the most accurate way to assess the lymph nodes in the chest that are the important nodes with respect to the stage of the lung cancer we will interrogate those nodes at the time of surgery with the ultrasound right at the beginning of the procedure when the patient's awake and comfortable. So, and since very most of the time, if the CAT scan and the PET scan are both suggestive that there's no evidence of metastasis, EBUS can change that situation or reverse that, but only in probably less than 3% of the patients. So we will do the EBUS exam or the endobronchial ultrasound right at the same setting under the same anesthetic. And we're very fortunate that we have cytopathology that is available immediately to look at the specimen and to assess, one, the adequacy I, that we have lymphocytes and that we're in the node, and B, whether or not that node contains carcinoma. So we know right away that information in case that it would impact on our surgery that particular day. So by combining it in one procedure, it's not done awake when the patient perhaps is uncomfortable from coughing and whatnot, but also it doesn't delay the evaluation of the patient by creating a separate procedure, then coming back to get the results and then going to surgery. So it really speeds up from the time that they are introduced to us as a patient in the office to the time that their surgery is, is done. And maybe we can continue the, our video clip. Um, here we're uh, continuing to take arterial uh, branches <clears throat> of, the, um, of the upper lobe, uh, soon to be taking uh, bronchus, which you see in the, in the foreground. The, um, 
as you mentioned, the instrumentation, as we look on the inside in the, in the uh, video, seems very similar to open instruments. Correct. Our, our trays actually have both thoracoscopic or long skinny instruments as well as our conventional instruments that we're quite comfortable with going around the pulmonary arteries. And we, we go back and forth um, between the instruments, primarily whatever seems to get the angle that we need to get um, to do the procedure safely. So um, again, I think the, the real emphasis on the instrumentation is that we really require that our techs in the OR are our dedicated thoracic techs because they know, they're watching the operation and they know what we need before we even ask for them. It's sort of like having, being, having radar assist you and that's really immensely helpful when doing this operation to have a tech who's really in sync, paying attention and watching the operation and knowing what's coming next because you really need a team approach in this operation for it to go smoothly mm -hmm. and quickly and, and have a good outcome for the patient. So. Um. Two things I would point out just looking at the video here. One, the, the piece of thread or, or the silk tie that is around the vessel, I think, demonstrates uh, the degree of magnification because that is literally a, a piece of very fine uh, string. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing here is um, a, a stapling device that is uh, being used to divide the, uh, to divide the vessel um, and control that uh, vessel on either side. Correct. We, um, for many years now, I would say probably from the early 90s, m most of lung surgery went, e be even before the thoracoscopic era, switched to doing a lot of the um, dissection of these very fragile, fine vessels with staplers. It, a stapler, um, s not surprisingly, is actually more accurate than individually stitching these arteries closed or tying them because a tie can compress it too tight and divide it just in the motion of tying it. So the staples are extremely precise and the staplers that we use for the artery is different than the stapler we use for the tissue and then the bronchus. They're all different thicknesses and they're very carefully precisely developed. This stapler here is actually de basically was devised specifically for pulmonary arteries and um, it, it has a, both the depth of the stapling the staples themselves, as well as the articulation, are really um, facilitate uh, getting around the bends that we sometimes need. It's not that we always need them, but when we need a particular angle, it's, it's really nice to be able to do that and to prevent having to open the patient, i.e. make a bigger incision, or put in another port just to get the appropriate trajectory. So stapling has evolved as the procedure has evolved. Um, perhaps you could answer, Jim, um, what percentage nationally of lobectomies are actually done this way now, both by dedicated thoracic surgeons and by general surgeons? The, uh, it's, a, it's a very small minority, actually, probably 25% or, or so that are being done thoracoscopically when we look at, um, uh, when we look at the national uh, numbers. Um, and that's for thoracic surgeons. And, that is, and that's exactly right, which is for uh, thoracic surgeons. Um, in, in many instances, the, uh, the ph surgeons who are doing the procedures can be um, uh, general surgeons who have uh, additional training in, in thoracic surgery, um, and that number would be lower. Um, so this is uh, certainly not as yet the standard of care uh, for lobectomy, but uh, I think um, certainly uh, dedicated general thoracic surgeons are moving in, in that direction, but uh, it's so, slower than one would expect. I think an important point to make to the audience is that um, the rationale for progressing to this, and there are some <clears throat> that say that it should be the standard of care, although I think that's being debated now, um, uh, predominantly because there are many surgeons that have not yet um, e e adapted this technique. But I think that what has been shown, uh, Dr. Uh, Scott Swanson has been a pioneer in this, showing that patients who have their lobectomy done thoracoscopically, not only is it safe, but it may be safer with fewer complications. 
and also it definitely enables patients to get to additional therapy quicker and get through it. So I think that um, these are really strong benefits that are potentially going to have it adapted nationally, just like in colon surgery now, laparoscopic colectomy has become really the preferred approach. I think that we're very close for this be becoming and being accepted by the thoracic community as the, quote, preferred approach. Uh, we have another uh, uh, question from an emailer. Are there patients who want to have VATS lobectomy rather than an open procedure and can't for some reason? Um, I think, uh, it, like many things, it depends on the most important thing is that the surgeon does the operation that he's most comfortable with. So sometimes there are constraints geographically that um, surgeons in the area may not have adapted the technology. Um, I think that, that in that case, patients, like any operation, should always seek um, providers that are really um, experienced in what they do and I think that it is um, something that they are, um, can and should ask their uh, surgeons and their primary care docs if, um, if this technique is available and, if, and, and, and or where can they have it done. There, there are certainly patients that, that the operation can't be done thoracoscopically or in a minimally invasive way, and some of our patients who have tumors, uh, primary tumors that are greater than a certain size that we wouldn't be able to take out of our access incision. Um, sometimes the location of a tumor may prohibit us as well. Well, correct. I think initially, years ago, <clears throat> we felt that if patients had more advanced disease, if they had nodal involvement, i.e. if they were stage two or stage three, that, that was an indication to do it open to make, quote, make sure that you got all those lymph nodes. But I think as the technique has evolved in the hands of the people um, doing this technique for years now, I think in an experienced VAT surgeon, that's not a contraindication. And the most important, as we spoke earlier, the most important thing is that all of the appropriate nodes are re resected with the specimen and that's really the judgment of the surgeon whether or not he feels he or she feels that she can have a, get a complete resection and resect the um, nodes that are necessary for many patients to be put on trial. Certain number of lymph nodes and certain stations have to be resected. Um, sometimes a larger tumor, if it's more central or abutting the heart, will need to be done in the old-fashioned old or more conventional open approach. Um, but the vast majority of patients, whether they're stage 1 or even up to stage 3A, which means lymph nodes on the same side in the areas that you're seeing here near, the, um, near these main blood vessels, they can still be done thoroscopically many, many times. Um, what, what we're showing you here, um, maybe you want to describe techni technically what we're doing here? Uh, here we're, we're just uh, seeing the stapler be advanced towards the airway or the bronchus. Uh, again, you can see the, uh, the uh, piece of silk uh, uh, thread, basically, that is, uh, um, that is being used as a guide around the, uh, around the uh, airway or the bronchus. Um, this uh, stapling device compresses and lays down three uh, rows of, uh, of staples on each side um, and then cuts in between. So six rows of staples with uh, a cutting device that uh, divides it so that there's three rows on each side. Um, and this stapler is a different color, correct? Yeah, a different color, a different uh, size of the staple. Uh, um, and um, a different amount of compression that we would use for the bronchus as opposed to the vasculature. And shortly, you'll see where we uh, partner with anesthesia, you're going to see the lung on the lower lobe here, which we're looking at now, basically turn pink and puff up. And that's um, Dr. Lepukin and gang. What are you doing here, Sergey? What, what makes that come back up? Well, we basically start, um, we take the clamp off the lumen that was um, inserted in that particular airway uh, and let the, let the anesthetic mixture get into the lung. We gently squeeze the bag that we use for manual ventilation of the lung 
to gently re-expand the alveoli. Make sure that there's no, uh, Dr. Weigel looks at this thing very carefully, make sure that there's no air leaks anywhere because we just divided the big airway. And it looks like uh, the staples in, uh, in, in this case uh, work beautifully. There's no air bubbles coming out of this. Uh, and uh, the, the... But if, I think if... Yeah. Um, what you, you could see briefly there, the, the blue of the big specimen that you're seeing is the deflated lung, and now it's yeah. devitalized, all the blood vessels are divided. Right. And to the right side of the screen, you could see the pink lung, which was the lung with some right. gas in it, which you can really see the contrast or the more, quote, normal color here on, on the right, right side of the screen. There's still some compression or collapse on the so right the side. So the rest of the lung that stays with the patient uh, actually looks normal. And the isolated part that's been divided, the bronch been divided, is uh, it's going to be soon taken out of the chest through a small incision. And what are we, what are we putting we, in there, Jim? Uh, we can... see a large, a large plastic bag, um, and that's what we use to, to protect um, the uh, wound, the incision, um, as we take the lung out. There, there is uh, the potential, and, uh, and it is uh, probably a better... Uh, reported in other types of uh, tumors, but we always are concerned about the potential for seeding of the tract of the incision with uh, with uh, tumor, um, and because of that, we remove the specimen with the uh, tumor in it uh, through a, uh, a, a plastic bag uh, that comes out um, that comes out of the uh, chest in a protected fashion. And you can see um, if we. <clears throat> Uh, paused it. Well, it's okay. You can kind of see here that the vessel or the blood supply to the remaining lobe is intact there with lots of little staple lines from the branches mm -hmm. and the bronchial staple line there as well. And what we're doing here is to check to make sure there are no additional lymph nodes and we're, quote, drying it up to make sure everything's satisfactory before we finish the operation. And eventually, I'm sorry, eventually the remaining lung will expand and take up the space of the removed lobe. And uh, the function of the lung is going to be fine. And maybe what we'll do right now, I think we're, our video is, a, is about to end, and maybe what we'll do is bring in Kyla, our clinical nurse, nurse specialist, to uh, talk about some of the um, things that occur after uh, surgery. One of the um, parts of our program at UW yes. Hospital is that we actually have a um, separate uh, cardiothoracic floor. We actually no longer have an intensive care unit that's separate or different. Our, we have an adaptable acuity care unit where every bed can be transformed into an ICU bed or a general care bed. It's a 27-bed mm -hmm. unit. And um, it does require a lot of training of the nurses to be able to do both. And so we actually have um, two dedicated nurses that are nurse uh, specialists, one for the cardiac side of the um, floor and one for the thoracic program, and, and Kyler is our thoracic uh, clinical specialist. And so maybe we'll uh, move away from the video now and, and uh, talk to Kyla. So, uh, Kyla, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about the instruction that the patients receive, both um, preoperatively, but, but mostly when uh, they're on our floor. Right, so um, typically when uh, they come to our floor, we let the patients know mm. that um, that evening it's expected that they're gonna be sitting up in a chair, and that the next morning that they can expect to sit in the chair most of the day, and that they'll be walking in the hallways around four to five times that day, and that we're gonna be doing a lot of coughing and deep breathing, and really just working their, their lungs while they're in the hospital. Um, that said, we're going to make sure that their pain is adequately controlled. We use a lot of <clears throat> excuse me, Tylenol and oxycodone. So we're going to make sure that patients' pain is well so that they can get up, walk, participate in all their therapies, and really get um, the best care that they can. At the end of surgery, we put a, a tube in that drains air. Uh, if there is any air leaking from our staple lines uh, fluid, uh, that always accumulates to some degree in the ch in the chest space. 
um, we put a tube in that that function that performs these functions uh, at the end of the operation. Um, the patients come to the floor with these tubes, and and one of the most common questions is, you know, how long do I keep my tube, and and uh, does it come out before I go home? Right. So normally you'll probably have the tube for a couple days. Um, I would say anywhere from one to three days. And occasionally patients will have to go home with a chest tube. And if that's the case, um, they go home with what we call the mini 500. And if they do have to go home with this, then either myself or another nurse on the unit will provide the family member um, with plenty of education on how to take care of this. When you go come back for your follow-up visit, which is about five to seven days, um, that's when they'll reassess to see if this tube can be removed. And usually if you go home with a chest tube, you'll have it for about a week. And but only about 10%, not even 10% of our patients do go home with a chest tube. And Kyla, we have a question from one of our viewers. So what about eating after surgery? So you guys will be, our patients will be allowed to eat. Um, typically, They'll just start with kind of clear liquid, so juices, um, jello. They're not usually very hungry right after surgery, and they may have a little bit of a sore throat from the breathing tube. But um, after that, they're allowed to eat uh, normally. But in Wisconsin, and, um, people have good appetites, and it's not that uncommon that they'll have a hamburger the night of surgery. Right. It really depends on the patient and how, more on how they tolerate the general anesthesia than the actual surgical procedure. So you mentioned that people will be up in the halls walking, and in fact, at least up to a, a chair the night after surgery in, in most instances. Uh, one of the questions we get a lot from patients is, will I be able to go upstairs after, uh, after I get home? And yes, they'll be able to go upstairs. Um, their activity level should be the same before surgery as it was after surgery. Excellent. Um, another question from... Uh, from our audience, what is the average recovery time after this surgery? And I would pose it to both Kyla and Dr. Weigel. Well, as Kyla said, the average length of stay for this procedure now is approximately two days. Um, uh, we keep uh, fairly accurate um, records of all of our patients. We participate in what's called the Society of Thoracic Surgery um, Thoracic Database. And so we know pretty precisely um, how many patients actually do go home with chest tubes. And it's actually closer to, it may feel like 10%, but it's actually closer to probably about 3% of the patients. Um, you, you always want remember the ones that do and, and forget the ones that don't have to go home with the tube. But most patients really um, don't complain about having the, the little, what we call mini 500. It's kind of like a pocketbook, and they tuck it in their pants, or they, they have all sorts of... Uh, in, ingenious ways to carry that thing around for a couple of days. Um, but the recovery, I always tell patients, we're not operating on your legs. I do expect them to be up walking the night of surgery. And if they're not, we ask them why. And we, if it's pain, we, we fix it because it's extremely important that you get up and get going. Um, most patients are home in two, approximately two days. And, and many patients, depending on what they do, how physical a job they do, can be back in work in a week or two. And so we see them pretty quick post-operatively, basically, to remove the tube if they did go home with the tube and to go over their pathology with them. A, a, a new sort of <coughs> kink in the process is that patients go home faster than pathologists get done with their specimens. Right. So we bring them back pretty quick to go over what they actually had, how advanced or not advanced their lung cancer was, and to discuss what their next treatment option is, if it is necessary, or if they're done, and whether they're just going to be followed with CAT scans. And so um, we tell them no tackle football or rugby for a month. But other than that, there really isn't any limitation. They can go back to driving when, when they're not taking any narcotics during the day, which for most patients is actually true the day they leave. Another question from our, uh, our viewers, what are the long-term limitations after surgery and are there things that a, a person may not be able to do? Um, the only limitation I tell my patients is no flying for approximately a month, um, primarily because there aren't good data to help guide us when the appropriate time is to fly. 
after after a lung surgery, and I ask them not to do any deep sea diving for a month month as well. Also, primarily because of lack of knowledge, not that it necessarily would be harmful. But other than that, really, my rule is no tackle football. But other than that, they can they can pretty much do what they want to do. And and to emphasize again, as as I do with my patients, that they don't drive when on narcotics during the day, which you all already mentioned, and and. Uh, the other thing is that the patient should obviously let let their body help guide them to some degree. If it, if it hurts a lot when they're doing it, then they're maybe overdoing it. Um, are there things that they won't be able to do? I think one of the things that um, is important to understand in patients with lung cancer is is that these are often patients who have compromised respiratory status as compared to someone who has not had, uh, who has not had a diagnosis of lung cancer. These are often people who have had a significant amount of smoking exposure, though they don't have to be. Um, and so it's often that they may be limited to some degree in their lifestyle, but, but uh, this is as much to do with the preoperative status as the postoperative status. Yeah, the vast majority of patients Probably 95% of the patients that do not come into the hospital on oxygen do not need oxygen long term. We have very precise ways to measure what their preoperative pulmonary function is and to predict for them what their postoperative pulmonary function is and to better help them decide on what the right option. We talked today a lot about a vaslobectomy for patients that may not be a candidate, may be too high risk for that, i.e., if they have bad emphysema or what you might know as COPD. Then we have other minimally invasive options for them that um, include a smaller portion of the lung taken out with, at the same time, placement of radioactive seeds that provides the same local control as a vaslobectomy. At the same time, we would take the lymph nodes out to better, again, and completely stage the patient. And again, by selecting which operation is appropriate, we can, can really do targeted or, quote, personalized medicine for the patient to limit their, our chance of significantly altering their current, basically, quality of life. And, and so I would say between the two techniques, we are able to say with fair certainty if we think we would put a patient on oxygen and, and greater than 95% of the patients that did not come in on oxygen are not going to be on oxygen long term. They may go home on oxygen for a week or two but that will be weaned off, and when we bring them back for the post-op visit, we'll do another what we call a six-minute walk and reassess them and titrate it down and get them back to their preoperative state. We have very um, advanced ways to assess the patient's total lung function and also to isolate the function attributable to the amount of lung that we're going to remove to predict for them and to include them in the decision process as to whether it's worth it to them to have their cancer out if it involves any potential for change in their quality of life. And, and maybe, um, Kyla, you can comment on, in these patients who, who very often do have a, a compromised, at least a, not a normal uh, uh, respiratory status to begin with, um, what, what are the uh, things that we, that we do on the floor to, to make sure that that those limitations do not adversely affect their, their outcome? So we do a lot of, um, again, coughing and deep breathing. We have a little machine tool that we use called the incentive spirometer, which is really going to cause a patient to work on taking mm -hmm. nice big breaths in and really expanding their lungs. We have another um, piece of equipment that you blow into and it kind of vibrates the chest and the lungs and it helps loosen secretions so that you can cough them up better. Um, we'll do the six minute walk like uh, Dr. Weigel said which just kind of gives us an idea if you need oxygen how much to go home on but again that's only usually for a week or two. Perhaps you could mention about the specialized respiratory therapists that reside on our floor as opposed to some of the different <coughs> floors. Yep so our respiratory therapists they only um, they cover our floor, they only cover our floor, and so they, they are very familiar with the treatments that we do. Um, they're excellent at helping with the nursing staff with um, doing a lot of that pulmonary hygiene. They're always on call um, and available at, uh, at any time for us to really use them, and they're, they're really 
They're great. It really emphasizes that that team approach from right. our anesthetic uh, uh, colleagues to our uh, surgical tech and nursing colleagues to our colleagues on the floor, which include the the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the physical therapists who, who can at times play an important role in our patient mm -hmm. population. And one thing we, what, when we went to this in around 2006, we converted from a conventional um, model of floor care and a separate ICU to this basically adaptable acuity care unit. And one of the th benefits, I think, that resulted that none of us perhaps perceived is that with the generation of nurses now on our floor, that this is the model they grew up with, this is what they know. Um, it really has elevated the level of nursing care on the whole floor because the vast majority of nurses are trained for both ICU care and general care. And even if the patient is general care, the nurse still has a skill set in the thought processes of an ICU um, nurse, and so they're very quick to pick up any deviation of what would be the normal standard mm -hmm. of care. So the vast majority of the patients, I would say probably 98% of the patients, actually are never even made ICU status and, in fact, simply are general care, because, and that's really a testament to the level of nursing that we have. We've really, they can come out of the mm -hmm. operating room, go to one room, and, and never have to leave that room per se. They're not transferred from one floor to the other. They stay in that room till they, they leave the hospital. So it's easier for them to really have the same group of providers from physicians to nurses. Well, I think uh, our discussion is just about done. I'd like to thank, thank all of our discussants, Dr. Weigel and, and uh, Kyla and uh, Dr. Lapukin, um, and we'll be signing off, I believe, very soon. Uh, thank you very much for your, your attention and joining us.